We worked hard this morning to uh, set the rules for superstring perturbation theory. And uh, then at the end, uh, I showed you the calculation. Well, I didn't show you the calculation. I showed you the result for uh, the genus 2 amplitude. And there is no way I would show you the calculation because it took a, f a number of years to actually see how to do that and to complete it. So what I want to do now, uh, this last lecture before your well-awaited gong show, is to uh, discuss some applications, actually. And uh, uh, basically, I'm going to limit myself to applications to low energy effective interactions. So let me first explain what I mean by that. So I've talked here about superstring perturbation theory. So this is an expansion in the string coupling, as we have seen. And uh, so it holds for weak coupling. We did uh, look at three level and one loop and two loops. And I sort of schematically indicated that on this graph here, as this is the coupling, then, right, if you go a little bit to slightly bigger coupling, you need genus one, genus two, genus so on and so forth. Um, so this is an approximation that holds for small string coupling, but actually holds for all energies. It goes up to arbitrarily high energy. Now there is in fact another approximation to superstring theory, which you also know, at least um, you know, in principle, which is supergravity. And so um, supergravity is the effective theory if you just retain of the full infinite spectrum of states in string theory if you just retain the massless sector only. So um, this theory uh, is only valid at um, low energy. It doesn't go up to arbitrarily high energy in string theory. But on the other hand, it holds for all values of the coupling. So we have sort of two um, more or less mutually exclusive regimes where we know string theory fairly well. So schematically, I've in indicated the energy vertically here. And uh, so, you know, the lowest approximation is the Einstein-Hilbert action, suitably supersymmetrized to get supergravity. And then there are higher order corrections. So for example, in type 2b, uh, there will be a correction of order r to the fourth. We already discussed, actually, that. I'm going to come back to that. And then there can be higher derivative corrections, and every derivative is a higher order in, uh, in energy and momentum. So uh, this is what I call an effective interaction uh, due to string theory. So it's a string theory correction to supergravity something that's not part of supergravity by itself, but if you look at the effects of string theory on low energy propagation of uh, supergravity particles, then these uh, interactions will in fact be important. And they come for every derivative uh, square you have, they come with an extra factor of alpha prime, so this is also the expansion and powers of alpha prime. Now, um, you can see from this graph, I have this green circle here. I'm not sure you can see it. This is the area where these two expansions meet. So in fact, one can learn from one expansion about the nature and the structure of the other expansion. Now, generally, this wouldn't get you very far, but there is one exception, which is the case of type 2b, where we have a special symmetry, SL2z, S-duality, not the same one that we saw this morning, SL2Z. And that symmetry actually um, allows you to um, go from weak coupling to strong coupling. It's a duality in the usual sense. So in fact, uh, one of my goals here is to show you that what one learns from superstring perturbation theory to fairly low order, zero, one, and two loops, actually has sort of um, you know, more general implications, at least in the case of type 2b. Please feel free to ask questions, right, at any time. 
Okay, so to start, let me go back and let me look at the closed superstring tree level for graviton amplitude. You can do this for all kinds of different fields of supergravity. I'm going to concentrate on just the graviton, essentially, for graviton scattering, uh, which is proportional to this uh, um, symbol that I used this morning, also r to the fourth, which symbolically stands for the scale of contraction of four uh, linearized vial tensors. So this is the same amplitude we saw this morning. And remember that S, T, and U, I didn't write it down again, but, but basically the Mandelstam variables but multiplied by alpha prime, so they are dimensionless. And you should think of alpha prime as the inverse of the um, uh, Planck constant square. So alpha prime is a small number, right? We want to expand an alpha prime. And so in fact, we want to expand this amplitude for small S, T, and U. And that makes sense because these things are dimensionless variables. So we want to look at low at low energy. Um, so the first contribution is, well, if in the, in the gamma function you just set STU to zero, there's only one term left over, which is one over STU. And this actually is the term I denoted here. It corresponds to the massless exchange in supergravity, okay, in the three different channels. It's symmetrical under permutations of STU, so it's a combination of the three channels in, at tree level. So this term, of course, is not local because uh, you're basically discussing the propagation of a massless particle, and Ken Wilson told you you cannot integrate out massless particles unless you're willing to tolerate non-local interactions. So we would not really call the effect of this first term an effective interaction. It's a, it's a non-local massless exchange. However, if you expand the gamma function, and I believe that uh, in um, a conference on amplitudes, everybody knows how to expand the gamma function, right? If you do dimensional regularization. And one of the things you learn is when you expand it, you get zeta functions. But the ratio of gamma of 1 minus 1 over gamma of 1 plus 1 actually kills all the odd degrees. And it means that in this expansion, as you can already see from a few low orders, the coefficients are polynomials in odd zeta values. If you did uh, something analogous for the open string, that's not true. So what are these various interactions? Well, basically, we can go by the number of alpha primes that we get. So the massless exchange is essentially R, the Einstein-Hilbert action. And uh, S has dimensions of 1 over, well, it has no dimensions. That's the way I arranged it here. So this term, the second term, has an alpha prime cube compared to the first term. And so, in fact, it's associated with an r to the 4, just on dimensional grounds you can count which terms you can get. And also you can see that it has no STU dependence, so it actually just multiplies r to the 4. So there, there is an effective interaction coming from tree level, um, which is of the form r to the 4, no derivatives, and has a coefficient which is gamma of 3, up to a factor of 2. So you can go on like this. There is no d square r to the 4 term because the coefficient that would multiply it is proportional to s plus t plus u. But you all know for massless particles that's equal to 0. And then there is a d to the fourth, r to the 4 term, which has zeta 5. And then there is a term which is uh, d to the 6th, which has zeta 3 q uh, square, and so on and so forth. So Ignoring everything else, this is already, in fact, a remarkable structure. There's a lot of remarkable structure in this expansion. So now I'm going to be interested in, as I said, in effective interactions and their structure in type 2b. So why is that? Well, because type 2b superstring theory has a duality, S-duality, or SL2z duality. The group is the same 
but its meaning is completely different from the one we used in uh, looking at the moduli space of the torus. So how does it, um, uh, how does it act? Well, it's a little bit complicated, but I can basically um, spell it out in the following way. If we consider the metric on space-time to uh, be normalized in Einstein frame, so that means so there is, th there is a metric, but there is also a dilaton field. So it's a priori unclear what the right metric is to consider. I could multiply the metric by some factor, which depends on the dilaton. How would you know the difference? They're all tensors and so on and so forth. The transverse degrees of freedom would be the same. So the Einstein frame is the one in which uh, the Einstein-Hilbert action has no dependence on the dilaton. So in that frame, uh, this duality is manifest. If you do another frame, it will not be manifest. So in Einstein frame metric, um, the Einstein frame metric is invariant. That's convenient. And that means that this vial tensor to the fourth is actually also invariant. Um, the axion and the dilaton in type 2b theory combine into a complex field, which I wrote down here. And that complex field transforms in a nonlinear representation of SL2z, given by the Möbius formula here, where the coefficients a, b, c, d are all integers and uh, the determinant is equal to 1. And the flux fields, well, in type 2b, you have two tree form flux fields which are real, the Ramon one and another Schwartz. They combine into a complex tree form field. And that, those, so that field trans, those fields transform linearly into one another. And finally, the phi form field is invariant. So what I actually gave you is the transformation law for type 2b supergravity, okay, which is, of course, more restricted than string theory. In fact, type 2b supergravity has an SL2r symmetry, a classical symmetry, acting in exactly the same way on these fields, but now with these restrictions of integers lifted. But this continuous symmetry of supergravity suffers an anomaly in string theory because the axion is a periodic field in string theory because of string instantons. And so in string theory, it's only the SL2Z subgroup that survives as an exact symmetry group. Okay, so that's just the definition of this symmetry in type 2B string theory. Now we were interested in effective interactions. So I'm going to, again, restrict to four graviton amplitude. So the effective interactions are of the form R to the fourth with a bunch of derivatives. So I wrote this, uh, I, the e for the, now I have indicated here R sub E just to make plain that it is in the Einstein frame. Okay. And the same thing for the volume factor here too, I indicated also GE just to make sure that we know that it's in the Einstein frame. So now, um, well, there is a, a field, the dilaton, which um, cannot be zero ever, because um, basically its imaginary part is the inverse of the string coupling. Uh, setting that to zero would mean the string coupling is infinite, which isn't a theory. So, in fact, the rope field is never zero, it transforms nonlinearly, which is a manifestation of the fact that it can never be zero. So, in fact, you need to include functions in this effective action which depend on the dilaton field. Now, to lowest order in derivatives, you can ignore the derivatives on the dilaton field, but you cannot ignore its value. Its value matters. It sets the scale for the string coupling. So the general expansion is something like this, where these curly E's are functions of rho. Now, if you have uh, a theory, a field theory or a string theory, that has a symmetry, 
then the effective action in the Wilsonian sense of that theory will inherit that symmetry. Okay. In the infrared, you may spontaneously break it, but the effective interaction above a certain scale inherits the same symmetry. So this effective interaction has to inherit the symmetry of type 2b string theory, which is SL2z. Of course, there are other symmetries like reparametrization invariance, which I've already built in, so that's already done. So, since in Einstein frame, the metric n r to the fourth are invariant under SL2z, that means that each of these coefficients, in fact, has to be invariant to make this effective action invariant. So each of these coefficients must, in fact, be invariant under this Mobius transformation of uh, the complexified dilaton field. And E is, well, the effective interaction is real, so the E's are real, the metric is real, the vial tensor is real. So these are real valued functions of a complex parameter, and they're invariant under SL2z. Such things are called um, non-holomorphic or real analytic modeler functions. So you've perhaps encountered modeler forms and modeler functions when you were dealing with the heterotic string or something like that, but those were holomorphic or meromorphic. These are real valued, they're, they're not holomorphic. Okay, so do we know such functions? Well, this is a classical object, uh, a classic subject that goes back to uh, Eisenstein and to Kronecker in the mid-19th uh, century. And so, in fact, there is a famous family of uh, such non-real analytic model of functions called Eisenstein series. So, how are they? The, so, I denote them by an E, but this is not a script E, okay? This is a straight E, it's a different object. So, when, so, I have a complex parameter S, and let's assume the real part of that parameter is larger than 1 then you can define ES by the so-called Kronecker-Eisenstein sum as a sum here over two integers. The prime means that I do not include M and N both zero because then of course the denominator blows up. And so I have, uh, this is a function of rho. Rho is complex, so I decompose it into its real and imaginary part. And so there is the imaginary part on top to the power S and then there is this uh, factor in the bottom. So what is this for a physicist? Well, actually, for a physicist, if you consider a torus with modulus rho, we consider tori with, with modulus tau, but now let's call it rho, living in the upper half plane, then what is this object? Well, actually, m plus rho n is just the complexified momenta on the torus, right? A torus is, uh, well, a two-dimensional object. It has an angle of, an inc of inclination, which is given by the real part of, of rho. And then it also has an aspect ratio. And in fact, uh, these numbers, m plus n rho, exactly span the momentum lattice in, in complex notation, okay? So this is really, um, this is really uh, uh, a familiar object, in fact, for physicists. So this combination, especially the factor of rho in the, in the top, are constructed in such a way that they are SL2z invariant. When SL2z acts by the Mobius transformation that I had here. Okay. And they're modeler invariant for any S, and you need the real part of S to be larger than 1, because otherwise this sum isn't convergent. Of course, um, the sum isn't convergent, but it's sufficiently similar to a Riemann zeta function that you will know that this can be analytically continued everywhere in the plane, except for a simple pole at s equal to 1. So these things are extremely well understood and fundamental objects in analytic number theory. Um, ES also satisfies the differential equation. In fact, it's an eigenfunction of the Laplace operator 
on the upper half, split, upper half plane. Laplace operator on the upper half plane, which is a hyperbolic manifold, has this form. There's this rho 2 to the square factor due to the fact that the metric on the upper half plane, the Poincaré metric, was absolute value of d rho square divided by rho 2 square. So this is also a familiar object. And so ES is an eigenfunction of this operator with eigenvalue S times 1 minus S. Now, um, remember rho is, um, well, it was rho. Um, oh, yes, here is rho. Rho was the combination of the axial and dilaton. So the imaginary part of rho is 1 over the string coupling. So that means that if we're interested in weak coupling, because after all, we're interested in comparing perturbation theory with whatever we're going to find here, we're interested in large rho 2. So in terms of the fundamental domain of SL2z, that means way up there on top of the, of the, of the half plane. So their expansion as rho 2 goes to infinity is the weak coupling expansion uh, when we identify rho as the dilaton field. And it's given in the following way. There are two power behave terms in rho 2. And then all the rest is exponential, exponentially suppressed for large rho 2. And there are some interesting numbers here to which we will come back uh, in a moment. So now um, um, I'm going to first of all make a little bit of a guess and then we'll substantiate it. So string perturbation theory calculations of course are not done in Einstein frame. They're done in string frame which differs from Einstein frame by rescaling the metric by a factor of the dilaton e to the phi over 2. So whenever we do a calculation in string theory and we want to compare it with the calculations that are relevant to duality in Einstein frame, we need to do this conversion. Okay. So here I'm going to write down on the left side with no motivation some combinations that involve not this curly E which we wanted to find, but just what we've learned from considering these Eisenstein series. So this is the Eisenstein series, depends on rho, and now I multiply it exactly by the combinations that I was interested in looking at when I investigated the effective interactions or the effective action. Okay, so I've written down those four interactions here, but I inserted arbitrarily E with indices 3 half, 5 halves, 3 half square, and seven halves. And so, while well, I did the work, I could have left it as a homework, could still leave it as a homework, you can work through this change of variables here to go from the Einstein frame to the string frame to convert these objects into a string frame notation on the right-hand side. So I've done that for you here. I use the values for the Eisenstein series you see that when s is a half integer, I get a zeta of, a, of, a, um, of an odd integer. So that's the first term, is always a zeta of an odd integer. And then um, uh, there's a second term. If s is a half odd integer, then this is an even, zeta of an even integer. And that's just powers of pi times um, a rational number. And so in fact what you get here, the first term of course always has an r to the fourth with a number of derivatives and the first term also with this conversion always has a factor of e to the minus 2 phi. What is e to the minus 2 phi? e to the minus 2 phi is 1 over the string coupling square. What does that mean? That means it's a three-level term. Okay, 
So the first term is actually always a tree-level term. It has that dependence on the dilaton to be a tree-level term. What are the subsequent terms? Well, the next term has no phi dependence at all. So it's a, I hear very faintly, yes, it's a one-loop term. Right, so this is a one-loop term. Here there's an e to the 2 phi, so it's a two-loop term, and so on. Now, I gave you already the expansion to tree level of the, of the uh, type 2 uh, uh, tree level uh, four-point function. And so to r to the fourth, we had a coefficient zeta tree. Well, notice actually this is all tree level, so it's only the first column that's relevant. Uh, not only is there a term, r to the fourth, actually have coefficient zeta of tree. Look at the next term. It has d to the fourth, r to the fourth, and it has a coefficient zeta of five. And then this term has zeta of tree square. Of course, I sort of knew what I had to do here to make that work. And the next term has a zeta of seven, so here's a zeta of seven. Interesting, isn't it? That, yes? What do the terms uh, multiplying e to the power minus 4 pi correspond to? e to the, oh, well that would be tree loops, right? Because e to the minus 2 phi, maybe write it down, e to the, e to the minus 2 phi, oh, this doesn't write very well, um, e to the minus 2 phi is equal to 1 over gs square. Oh, did I write minus? Yeah. Oh, no, no, sorry, that's a typo. Sorry, I didn't see that, yes. So I need to, uh, sorry, this is a 2 phi and this is a 4 phi. Thank you. Yes, okay, I didn't see it from here, yes. Absolutely, so this is a, um, this is a, a two-loop term, this is a three-loop term. Yes, thanks a lot. Okay, so of course we just simply took a, a guess here, right? But it is sort of remarkable that from a natural object, the Eisenstein series, we could actually reproduce, if we wanted, uh, tree-level corrections. And not only that, we would in fact predict that there is a one-loop uh, correction to the R4 term with a definite coefficient, because the ratio of these coefficients is fixed by the Eisenstein series, and so on and so forth. Is well, this really a guess? Well, I'm going to come to it. Uh, in some sense, you have uh, uh, the symmetry condition. Uh, they really specify the uh, right. very simple except uh, factors. Yes. Numerical factors and numerical factors. You can I'm going to come to it. So is this a guess? So actually, yes and no. So we have to do this one by one. So let's look at the r to the 4 term first. So the r to the 4 term was actually derived by Green and Goodpearl and Van Hove in the mid-90s by in different ways, but in particular by summing d instanton contributions. So they obtained not just the perturbative contribution, but they actually summed these fellows here explicitly. Okay. That uh, you know, requires a little work to do that, but if you do this in superspace, then it amounts to essentially counting zero modes. So that's a lot easier. So they summed d instantons and found this result. In fact, they didn't find the result. They found this sum, and then it happened to be that Michael Goodpearl went to a seminar the same day that they found it, and the speaker in math was exactly talking about this function because it has some significance in analytic number theory, and then they realized, well, actually, we can give this thing a name. So then, a little bit later, Green and Seti proved that um, if you implement space-time supersymmetry on the effective action, remember I told you, if you have a symmetry of the original theory, it must be inherited by the effective interaction. So there must be a supersymmetry on this effective interaction here. Okay. Of course, you don't have the whole Lagrangian or anything. You have to cook it up as you go along. And also, as you go along, you need to change, you need to correct the supersymmetry transformations themselves, how they act. So it's very difficult to do, but they did. 
and they found uh, agreement and they found this again. So in fact, for the lowest order term, this guess is exact, works. And in particular, it predicts that there is an R to the fourth correction to one loop and nothing beyond it. For this is a very strong statement. It basically says that to this effective interaction, there are only three level and one loop contributions and instantons. But instantons there always are. But there are no higher order perturbative corrections to it. OK. Um, so in fact, uh, they also showed that this one loop interaction is correct and matches. And then we also showed that, for example, the genus 2 correction is 0. We'll come back to that in a second. How about the next term? So now the next term, this supersymmetry method, is hopelessly complicated and, and uh, they couldn't do it. And also uh, the de-instanton calculation is very complicated. Uh, this has to do with the fact that to this interaction only half BPS states contribute, but to the next interaction half BPS plus quarter BPS states contribute, and that's much more complicated. So they invented other methods, combining compactifications of M theory, computed on a torus, and so on and so forth, and gave pretty good evidence that um, the next order correction is indeed exactly e to the 5 halves. So this prediction is also true. It means there is no one loop contribution, but there is a two loop contribution, which um, uh, Michael Goodpearl, Fong, and I checked was indeed exactly right on the nose. So that term also works. But the next term actually is not quite that, because uh, with the same methods they used for the earlier terms, they derived an equation for this E6 term. And it's not just E3 half square. It's actually the solution to this Laplace equation with the right-hand side. Nonetheless, this. Uh, so, so these terms are actually not reliable. They need to be replaced by the solution to this equation. And uh, for the last line, there is no equation that's really reliable. OK, so um, uh, yeah, so here I just wanted to say that this E6 term that comes out of here um, was checked to two loops. And I'll come back to that. And there is a calculation to three loops using the pure spinner formulation in string theory. So in summary, we end up with a number of non-renormalization theorems telling you that there are no perturbative corrections for E0, to, for the R to the fourth at gene of 2 and higher, D to the fourth, R to the fourth at gene of 3 and higher, and uh, D to the sixth, R to the fourth at gene of 4 and higher. OK, so now um, these are general predictions. Now I would like to come to how you actually compute some of these things. So let me start with the low energy expansion at genus 1. I'm still doing type 2. So this is the formula uh, from Green and Schwartz that I gave you this morning with this characteristic structure. And so we had um, a partial integrand where we had not integrated over the modulus of the torus, but we had integrated over all the position uh, points of the vertex operators. So this involved the scalar Green's function on the torus. And what is that? Well, actually, it's also given by a classic result. Right? We know all the momenta on the torus, so in fact this Green's function is essentially given by a Fourier series. And here it is. So if you write z in sort of co-moving coordinates, a plus alpha plus tau beta, where alpha and beta are real, then it takes this simple form. So uh, expanding the full amplitude is, one, is something we'll come back to a little bit later. But for the time being, let me uh, expand the, uh, the partial amplitude. So 
The partial amplitude is something that depends on the Mandelstam variables and on the modulus. But it's a modeler invariant function. It's a modeler function. It's invariant under SL2Z. So that means it's invariant for under SL2Z for any value of the Mandelstam variables. So when we expand it, every term in the series is, in fact, modeler invariant. And so um, this expansion is given by, you can think of it as given by a graphical expansion. I expand in powers of s. Every time I have an additional factor of s, I have an additional propagator, Green's function. And so I get diagrams of this type. So here I wrote down what you need for d to the 4, r to the 4, to genus 1. You just have this little vacuum diagram, which is very easy. Then you go up, d to the 6, r to the 4. Now I need three propagators. So I have these two diagrams, and so on and so forth. So as you go to higher and higher order in alpha prime, you have more and more diagrams, needless to say. So the question is, how, do you, how can you understand the space of these functions? So it's actually advantageous to group them, as I had done, by the number of loops they involve. So this number of loops has nothing to do with the loop order of the perturbative expansion. This is just the alpha prime expansion. So here are all the one-loop diagrams, all the two-loop diagrams, three loops, and so on and so forth. And you see that if you want to get complication, you can get complication. Gets to higher and higher order, uh, more and more uh, loops in these diagrams. Well, let's start with the simplest one. What are the one-loop diagrams? Well, a one-loop diagram is just a, an integration of concatenated Green's functions. And those integrals can be done in terms of the Fourier series. And so, in fact, um, that if you do this concatenation from the point of view of momentum space, the momentum in each propagator is the same, and you just raise the propagator to that power, and the propagator here is this momentum factor in the denominator. Now, this is an object we have encountered before. It's just the Eisenstein series. And k here is an integer. k is the number of, um, of propagators you have. So I think I had already said all this. So it's absolutely convergent. There is a reflection formula, and it obeys. Uh, so we had already seen this. So in fact, one loop we completely understand, really. So what's going on to two loops? Well, to two loops, here I've drawn a couple of diagrams. So what you can have is just three propagators. But you can also have propagators that are doubled or concatenated. And so that you can ind indicate with this bivalent vertex here, where you cut the propagator and put a dot on it. So the general expression to, uh, for two loops is labeled by uh, the number of concatenated propagators you have on each leg. So A1, A2, and A3 are those numbers. So you raise each propagator to these respective powers. And then you sum over all momenta. And of course, complete momenta and total momentum is conserved in these graphs because they're vacuum, the bubble graph, vacuum graphs. And so there you go. So if, um, if the sum of the A's is W, then uh, that, um, modeler, that modeler graph function contributes to the effective interaction of the type d to the 2 w r to the 4. So by the way, we gave the name of modular graph functions to these things, because basically to every graph with some mild conditions, you can associate a modular function, which generalizes the Eisenstein series. So each one is a modular function, but it's different from Eisenstein. OK. So they're modular functions. And uh, so the natural question is, do they obey some interesting equations? These are, after all, integrands, right? We are to integrate those over moduli space. So the more we know about these functions before attempting to integrate, the better chance we have of succeeding in integrating them. 
this L2Z manifest for these constraints? Uh, yes, it is actually manifest because the integers m and n transform linearly under uh, the SL2Z. And so uh, these constraints also are linear. And so you order more phi over the whole SL2Z. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Sure. Uh, the idea of already integrated over both variables. Uh, this is to be integrated over tau, just the modulus of the torus. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, so the Eisenstein series obeyed a Laplace equation. So let's try what happens if we apply the Laplace operator. So in fact, you find out that uh, each of these functions, I've arranged them in increasing weight here, satisfies a Laplace eigenvalue equation with a right-hand side, inhomogeneous. But the right-hand side is, in a sense, known. These are just combinations of Eisenstein series, or bilinear combinations, plus things that occur at a lower order. Note that the eigenvalues, 0, 2, 6, 0, of course you have very few data, but they're all of the form of s times s minus 1, namely the same spectrum as the um, Eisenstein series themselves. And in fact you can prove this generally, I'm not going to go through the proof, but you can basically show that these two-loop modular graph functions are combinations, linear combinations, of objects, which are also modular functions, which satisfy this inhomogeneous Laplace equation on the upper half plane with a right-hand side which is a polynomial of total degree 2 in the Eisenstein series. And the eigenvalues are of the form s times s minus 1, where the s's are integers and uh, well, there is some formula for them, but I'm not sure the, there is some formula for the, the values and the associated degeneracies, how many eigenvalues, eigenvalues you encounter. And so you can cook up this kind of spectrum type formula, like in chemistry, what the eigenvalue is and what the multiplicity is. And, uh, and so this completely describes, in fact, this spectrum. Um, so I've only done two loops here, but one can go higher, of course. Of course, the complexity grows, like with Feynman diagrams in general, uh, factorially, but in fact, to, uh, to all orders, one can show that these um, functions, these modular graph functions, obey a system of differential equations. And uh, sometimes these differential equations can be integrated, and so imply algebraic relations between them. I don't really have the time to go into that. Um, and in many ways, these modular graph functions generalize things that are probably known to you, like polylogarithms and multiple zeta values. For example, you can see that from the very definition, if I just um, ignored the tau dependence here, Right, I would actually have a sum over a product of powers of inverse integers. That's multiple zeta values, or at least it can be decomposed into multiple zeta values. So this is a modular generalization of it. These are not just numbers, these are now functions, modular functions. So whether these ever come into um, you know, field theory amplitudes, I don't know, a priori but I would not be entirely surprised. They certainly come in string amplitudes. Okay, so we played enough with genus 1 now, so let's graduate up to genus 2. Well, I gave you a formula this morning for genus 2. Here was the full genus 2 amplitude, and it was again an integral over the moduli of a partial amplitude, which I also wrote down. I didn't explain it very much, but there is the exponential of the Green's function familiar from genus 1 and in fact which occurs for any genus 
And then you have to integrate it on a non-trivial surface, so there has to be a volume form. And this volume form is actually extremely simple. It's a wedge product between something holomorphic and anti-holomorphic. And so I wrote down the holomorphic thing, so it's, it's linear in the Mandelstam variables. And then it involves this biholomorphic form with two points, which I actually gave this morning, but you don't have to remember it. So this is perfectly well defined. It's actually a fairly simple formula, given that it's genus 2. So we can now ask the same question. What are the contributions to genus uh, 2 effective interactions from perturbation theory? So R to the fourth, OK, well, R to the fourth. Well, um, we don't even have to expand the exponential in the Green's functions because each y is linear in the Mandelstam variables. So the lowest order is going to contribute something bilinear in the Mandelstam variables times r to the fourth. That means there is no correction to r to the fourth itself because the lowest, because y vanishes for s t u equal to zero. For d to the fourth, r to the fourth, I can throw away the exponential, set it to one, and indeed, this gives me a constant on moduli space. And Carl Siegel computed the volume of moduli space for, N, well, for these Siegel domains for any genus. So in fact, we just take that number and you find precise agreement with the uh, prediction made here. OK. So um, d to the sixth r to the fourth, well now you need to bring down one power of the Green's function. And so uh, this is a non-trivial integral now. So I wrote it down here. So this is the part for d to the fourth r to the fourth. This is the part for d to the sixth r to the fourth. And now there is a curly phi of omega here. This is a non-trivial function on moduli space. We're guaranteed that it is invariant under the modular group at genus 2 because this whole partial amplitude was. So it's, an in, it's a modular invariant function at genus 2. So Mike Green and I showed a number of years ago that this function actually had been introduced in the math literature just a few years before by Kawazumi and Zhang. So it's called the Kawazumi-Zhang invariant. And I've written it down here for you. Why is the imaginary part of the period matrix, okay, I'm just writing it down to show that there is an explicit formula, which you can completely see. I did not write down the expression for the Green's function because it's complicated. And uh, nonetheless, one can study this. And uh, so here is this object. Now to predict, to see whether the prediction from S-duality and um, supersymmetry holds to this order, this is this calculation, we actually had to perform the integral of this quantity. And so we asked around uh, with some mathematicians how to do this integral, and they said, well, you are crazy. You can never do this integral. Th this is beyond what can be done. Uh, so that's sort of unfortunate. But then we went in a different direction and actually showed that this invariant satisfies a Laplace equation, Laplace eigenvalue equation. So the Laplacian here is a more fancy object. It's the Laplace Beltrami operator on the fundamental domain for SP4Z in the Siegel upper half space with this standard metric on it. Okay, so it's a little bit more complicated, but it's a very well-defined object. And so there's some funny eigenvalue, 5. And there's also a right-hand side. And the right-hand side is a delta function, which is supported on the node where the genus 2 Riemann surface degenerates to two genus 1 surfaces. Okay. And you can compute that number. We computed that number. And um, so now, okay, so now how do you compute the integral of this gadget over moduli space? Well, actually, it's very easy now. It's a page, more or less. Because you use this formula to write phi in terms of the Laplacian on phi plus the delta function. 
But the Laplacian on phi you can reduce to a boundary term, which is non-zero, but you can do that. And, uh, and of course the delta function you can evaluate and you find this number which exactly agrees with S-duality and supersymmetry. Okay, so how, many, how much time do I have uh, left, Andrew? Oh, maybe as much as 10, I would say. Right? 10? Okay, that's more than enough. Okay, so basically um, I have shown you here that using modeler graph functions at genus 1, and then also this Kawazumi Zhang invariant at genus 2. From perturbation theory, you can actually evaluate uh, the effective interactions in type 2b of a certain kind. And the reason that those particular evaluations worked was because the integrals over moduli space were in fact convergent. But that's not always the case, as I showed you, or at least argued this morning, um, if you go to um, high enough order, then near the boundary of moduli space, the propagator becomes large and actually creates new singularities, namely branch cuts in ST and U starting at zero. They represent the gene of two contribution to um, uh, the pair production or triple uh, particle production from um, massless states, massless intermediate states. So in fact, in general, um, you need to work harder because um, in addition to having these local interactions, you will actually have um, non-local contributions due to branch cuts. This is the analog, but at higher loops, of this um, uh, tree-level interaction of 1 over STU. Okay, this was a, an interaction of massless particles. So you can determine the effective interaction only once you have taken out those parts which are due to the exchange of massless particles. So I now want to discuss uh, how you do that. So we're interested in the non-analytic contributions at low energy. So in string theory you have an infinite tower of mass, massive particles. So at every massive particle, there is a new branch cut that starts because I can have a massive particle and a massless particle in the intermediate states, and that will produce a, a, a branch cut there. So at low energy, I'm only interested in uh, the configuration where I have only massless particles exchanged, namely the branch cut starting at zero. So um, let's do one loop, that's the simplest case. Um, so at one loop I can just look at the two particle um, unitarity cut in the F channel for example. So imagine that this is a, a, a one loop object. Its discontinuity can be written in terms of uh, tree level amplitudes, but in fact if I just have any S-channel two-particle cut, this contribution to unitarity can be written out in this way. I've written it out here. And so now we want to evaluate this. So um, we would like to obtain the genus 1 discontinuity from tree level. I now want to specialize. We're going to use the fact which I guess is not really proven, but we'll only need it up to uh, genus 1 and, I mean, genus 0, 1 and 2. Uh, we'll use the fact that the kinematical factor is always the same in the four-point function for gravitons times some scalar reduced function and satisfies this summation formula due to, uh, well, some people in the room here <laughs> uh, of a long time ago and I think also Svi explained it this morning, there is this summation formula over intermediate polarizations in n equal 8 supergravity in four dimensions, but it's the same formula in 10 dimensions for n equal 2 supergravity. So you can use this formula, and this allows you to get an effective formula for the discontinuity, which I wrote down here. And, uh, okay, so now these pieces can be taken as three-level pieces, and this is the one-loop piece. 
And I suspect I have actually forgotten a factor of s to the fourth in here. Um, so if I now appeal to the expression I showed you before for the tree-level amplitude, there was the exchange of massless particles, which is the dominant piece, and then corrections, which are due to string theory. So if I substitute in, in each factor here, the contribution of the massless exchange, then basically by power counting, I see that the discontinuity is proportional to s. But now I could replace one of the on-shell vertices here by a higher order correction. So for example, let me keep one to be the lowest order correction and the other one to be zeta three times a constant. That's three powers in alpha prime higher and that means it's three powers in s higher, so here it is, so that's the discontinuity, and, and so on, and I can continue in this way. Since this is one loop, I know that this discontinuity must be produced by a log of minus s, so in fact, I have from this consideration a formula for the one loop amplitude near s t u equal to zero, up to analytic terms, which of course I cannot get in this way. So having this formula in fact tells me a lot because it gives me uh, the non-analytic contribution to the amplitude and so this, I just rewrote the formula. These numbers are uh, rational numbers, okay, I didn't write them out, but they're, they're just rational numbers. So. Um, the effective action d to the square r to the fourth vanishes, but there is actually a non-analytic part proportional to that effective interaction. You also see that there are no contributions here of the non-analytic piece to r to the fourth, d to the fourth r to the fourth, d to the sixth r to the fourth, and d to the tenth. d to the tenth would be s to the fifth log s, but that term isn't there. If these, since these non-analytic contributions are missing, that means that the analytic contribution that I computed from the modular graph functions are convergent on modelized space and give you completely the effective interaction to genus one. Um, if I have a term that does occur here, for example, d to the fourth, r to the fourth is here, that means that there is a leading non-analytic piece which involves a log, but this log can have a normalization. I need to normalize this log. And depending on how I do that, that will influence what the value is of the remaining effective interaction. So that's sort of the lowest case where this happens, so let me actually look at that case a little bit. So I'm going to tell you how you derive this effective interaction from uh, the genus 1 amplitude. So now the integration over moduli space is not convergent. So what we do is we uh, cut it off, we split it up into two pieces with an upper cut off of L. So there's a part less than L, a part larger than L. We split the amplitude in that way. And so both of these pieces depend on L, but the sum is independent of L. Uh, the piece where the imaginary part of tau is bounded by L, that's analytic in S, because you never reach the uh, large tau behavior of the integrand. And the other piece is non-analytic at S i j equal to zero. But in fact, you can take L very large and use approximations for that part which are essentially the supergravity approximations. And in fact, uh, if you put this all together, so the first part, the analytic part, you compute from modular graph functions, and the other part, you compute by basically expanding around supergravity. And so here is the full result, the contribution to d to the fourth, r to the fourth. So there is some interesting local interaction, and then there is also the non-analytic part. Okay. Note that there are no infinities, no renormalization needed. This with just pure analytic continuation gives you the entire result. 
There is a very interesting story on transcendentality, but I'm running out of time, so I cannot go into it. And there is a very interesting story on genus 2, which my green Boris Piolin and I have been working on, and uh, that would be for another school, I guess. So there are many things I have not discussed, because uh, of course this is a huge subject, so some additional developments in some recent papers of Ed Witten. There's a very nice clarification of super Riemann surfaces with Ramon punctures. This was a subject that was not that clear before. And uh, various things can be implemented. There is a super period matrix when you have R punctures and so on and so forth. Another subject I have not had the time to talk about is the relations, new relations between open and closed. String amplitudes, uh, Oliver Schlatter and company have been working extensively on that. And then some more immediate outstanding issues is, uh, well, um, if we're ever going to observe the effects of string theory, it's forcibly at low energy because the Planck scale is enormous. So uh, that's why computing low energy effective interactions and understanding their structure, I think, has some value. And so we are very interested in understanding these properties well in terms of modular graph functions, but also perhaps in calculating those from perturbation theory without having to deal with all the complications of supermoduli space. And finally, um, how supergravity divergences uh, come out or interact with um, with these results in string theory is interesting. I didn't mention ambitwister strings. And of course, one of the most interesting questions is how the I always did perturbation theory on flat space time. But suppose you have to do it on an interesting background like ADS5 cross S5. How do you do that? People really do not know how to do this. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, if I understand correctly, some modular graphs contain non-perturbative effects, right? There's exponentially suppressed terms? Uh, or well, these are essentially non... They're not non-perturbative in a string coupling, right? So, yeah, unfortunately, there are sort of two conflicting things here. There is the modulus tau of the world sheet, and then there is rho, which is the dilaton axion complex field, okay. So um, the exponential corrections in, in rho, they've, those are due to, to instantons, to de-instantons. But the ex exponential corrections in um, the world sheet tau is, you can call it a non-perturbative effect on the world sheet, but it's just essentially free field theory on a finite world sheet. It's because you have a compact surface that you have exponential corrections. Okay, so Yara is busily shining his gun, his coffee outside. Thank Eric again for a lovely talk. Thank you.